You got a good crowd, man. All right. Whoa. Get him up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, I tell you what, it, I think it's time for me to go home. It's not going to get any better than this. When you got, when you got Clyburn and Matthews introducing you, it's all over, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you also probably close those doors so they don't freeze to death. But make sure my little sister Valerie's in here. I want to make sure Val's in. There's my sister Valerie, by the way. I, like a lot of you guys, have a sister who's a hell of a lot better looking, a hell of a lot smarter than I am. You, where do you want me to go? Okay. Well, I tell you what, they're just seeing if I can still lift something. Jim. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Folks, uh, I'm honored to be here and uh, with uh, Solicitor Pasco's uh, posse, uh, pretty big posse he has here, and hosting all of us, and thank you for asking me to say a few words. Folks, uh, I'm doubly honored, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, uh, to be here with one of the truly great leaders of Congress, and that's not hyperbole. Uh, my great friend and your friend, uh, uh, the leader, Jim Clyburn. Jim, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I've said for a long time, Jim, I think you're the heart and soul of this state. I've been coming here since uh, 1973, because when I first got elected to the Senate as a 29-year-old kid to the United States Senate in 1972, uh, right after I got elected, uh, reason I think I understand Jim's pain a little bit is my wife and daughter I got a phone call before I got sworn in my wife and daughter were killed a uh, tractor trailer ran into them while she was Christmas shopping on December 18th and before I got sworn in and and uh, killed my daughter and killed my wife and my two boys were not expected to make it but a guy named Fritz Hollins and Pizzi Hollins not a joke they came to see me and they worked on me and worked on me with another guy named Mike Mansfield from Montana and said, just come and, and just, just come and stay for uh, just six months. Just stay six months. And uh, Senator, I didn't realize that uh, what they were doing was saving my sanity at the time. And I came and, uh, and you're still stuck with me. But I started coming down here and getting to know a lot of folks. And uh, I love this state. Everybody says, why do I know it so well? Well, I've been coming here since 1973. And I got to know Jim early, early on. And an awful lot of you, they're here. And I just want to thank you for the hospitality you've always shown me when I've been here. And it's a reason why I think uh, I understand, like many of you have been through what Jim and I have been through, that, uh, you know, uh, while we're still mourning Miss Emily, she was an incredible, incredible woman, did more, did more than anybody gives her credit for. You know, uh, lately, some mornings when I wake up, and I, I mean this sincerely, I feel like it's, I'm reading a history book from 1920 than I am uh, living in 2020. You know, I hear voices, the voices of intolerance, the voices of hate, the choruses of hate, exclusion and denial. I hear the pain and division, and then I uh, the, uh, the assaulting of too many of our communities and people in our communities. I hear the echoes of the not-too-distant future and the fights that we thought we had fought and won before. Amen. Jim, I listened to what you had to say on the other side of the door. You hear them, too. And we all know, we all know that when we hear that call, we just can't sit around. We just can't sit around. Why do you got to get up? We got to get up and get to work. And that's what the people in this room and my family and where I come from, we've always done. Get up. My dad used to say the measure of success is not whether you get knocked down, it's how quickly you get up. That's the God's truth of what he'd say. 
you got to get up. It's time for us to get up and take back this country. You know, that's what we've always done. That's what Jim's always done. That's how he, as they said, he mismet, mismet, met Miss Emily in prison. Well, they both got arrested because they were protesting inequity and prejudice and hate. You know, that's how we push this country forward. It's not, it's not been, it's not happened by magic. Here in Owensburg, you all know better than anyone, four years after the Civil Rights Act was passed, three years after the Voting Rights Act was passed, there was the Orangeburg Massacre. After we thought we had turned the corner. And then when the country was consumed by a war in Vietnam at the time, students were still fighting to end segregation, not just in the law, but in reality here. South Carolina Highway Patrol opened fire. I remember as a kid, early days of college, back in Delaware, hearing about unarmed students being gunned down Three students killed, dozens more wounded. Unlike the clashes in Birmingham in 63, the world didn't pay attention because it was consumed by a war, a war that an awful lot of black folks died fighting. Folks, a few months later, Dr. King was assassinated and then Bobby Kennedy. I only had two political heroes in my life. My dad was my hero, but the political heroes I had, for a fact, I've written about it for over 40 years, were Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. And guess what? My senior year in law school, the last semester when I was graduating, both were gunned down. So when I got out of law school, I found myself going back to Delaware. In my state, is the only state in the United States of America occupied by the National Guard, by the military since the Civil War. A significant portion of my state was burned to the ground. And I had a job. I had a job with a fancy law firm, decent people, the oldest law firm in the state. But I realized I couldn't just do that. And so I quit within five months and became a public defender to represent the folks I grew up with on the East Side. And folks, I thought things were never going to ever get better. I thought blacks and whites in my town were never going to be talking to one another again. I wonder whether anything was ever going to change, for real, like many of you have probably thought in the history of South Carolina. But then, Jim's heard me say this before, 40 years later to the month, I was standing on a railroad station in Wilmington, Delaware, on the Northeast Corridor, going from Washington to New York. And I stood there, and I was waiting for a black man to come about 20 miles from Philadelphia on an Amtrak train to pick me up on the 17th of January to take me down to Washington, D.C., 100. 28 miles to be sworn in as president and vice president of the United States of America. And I called my kids, my three kids. My son, Bo, was the attorney general, a war hero, a year in Iraq, time in Kosovo. I called him up. I called my son, Hunter, up, my surviving son. And I called up my daughter, who's a public, she works for, uh, runs a, a nonprofit for helping people stay out of prison. And my son, Hunter, was head of the World Food Program, USA. And I said, look, the east side was burned to the ground. We can look out where it used to be just flat. And over the Third Street Bridge, burned down. And guess what? It's built up now, and we're talking. And I'm being picked up by Barack Obama to be Vice President of the United States of America. And you know what? So when I set out on the campaign trail this time around, and I decided to run, talking about the soul of America, I wasn't being nostalgic. I was being realistic. I was trying to take 
I'm not trying to take America back to some period that never existed. I'm trying to take America to a place it's never, ever, ever been. We all know the animating promise of this nation, that all men and women are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Or we hold these truths to be self-evident, ladies and gentlemen. But our failure to live up to Jefferson's words doesn't diminish their power. Tomorrow we celebrate Dr. King, and we all remember his immortal words, I have a dream. But sometimes we forget what he went on to say. He said, and I quote, it's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. And then he said, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. King did not give up on the American creed. He never gave up on the American creed because of the significant sins of this nation. He believed in its essential truth and that our calling was to make it true for everybody. You know, and the work, it's the work we're called to do again because of Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Trump has used his power to lead an assault again on the right for people to vote. The Department of Justice has literally abandoned abandoned its voter dealing with trying to make sure people get to vote. Voter suppression is rampant. In the last 10 years, 25 states, half of all the states, have passed laws to throw up roadblocks to voting. Half the states. His rhetoric has emboldened the worst among us to crawl out from under their rocks. Hate groups are on the rise in America. White supremacists that used to operate in the shadows are now emboldened to spread their hate openly. Remember Charlottesville, just in 2017. Those neo-Nazis and white supremacists and the KKK marching out of those fields, carrying torches, chanting the same anti-Semitic bile and carrying Nazi swastikas that existed in Europe in the 30s. And what did Trump do? when a young woman was killed resisting the hate. What did, she, what did he say? They said, what do you think, Mr. President? He said, there are very fine people on both sides. No president of the United States has ever, ever, ever said anything like that. This guy is more George Wallace than George Washington, and the whole country knows it. And ladies and gentlemen, the fact is that we have to. We have a, he drew a moral equivalence between those promoting hate and those standing against it. And the simple truth is, Donald Trump as president, with him there, the literally the core values are standing in the world, and I believe our very democracy. Everything that's made America, America is at stake. Folks, we have to defeat him. And when we do, and when we do, we're going to seize a tremendous opportunity to take the next great step forward in racial justice, criminal justice, economic justice, environmental justice, to give the marginalized, the demonized, the isolated, the oppressed, finally, finally, a full share of the American dream to rip the roots of systemic racism, just rip them out. Folks, not only to rebuild and revitalize this country, but to make sure this time, everybody, everybody comes along. Black and brown, straight and gay, everybody comes along. Those with disabilities, everybody. Folks, you know, remember, none of you women can remember, but some of the men will, because you're not old enough, when Bull Connor and his dogs came out. Selma, what happened? He thought he was nailing a stake in the heart of civil rights, but what he did, he, in fact, emboldened it. He made us stand up and say, enough is enough is enough. Well, Donald Trump has made us say, enough is enough is enough. No more. We can change this world because the country now knows what's really at stake. 
We can do this. I know what it takes to pass health care reform in this country. I was proud to work alongside Barack to get it done. We need to build on it. We can do this. I know what education is such a great equalizer. We know we need a real investment in the most troubled schools and Title I schools. We know. We know. That's why I'm proposing to spend $45 billion a year instead of 15. We can do this. We can make sure we invest in HBCUs, which are the future of this country. $70 billion in HBCUs. And finally, we're going to pass Jim Clyburn's 10 20 30 anti poverty initiative to change the way the federal government uplifts persistently impoverished communities without increasing taxes or the deficit. Folks, it'll go a long way to ending the legacy of systemic racism and breaking up makeup and patterns in neighborhoods, housing patterns, employment, access to transportation, whole range of things. And it's not hard. It'll benefit everybody in the country. And by the way, you know, if we spend as much money as he wants to spend on a wall and keeping kids in cages, guess what? We can end homelessness in America for the same number. We can end it. It's not that we can't do these things. Folks, we also, we also need to make sure that we deal with the fact that too many people, especially black men and women, are still incarcerated in this country. I'm proud of the steps that President Obama and I took to reduce the federal prison population by 38,000 folks. Now we have to immediately pass a thing called the Bobby Scott Act, Justice Act. And then he's agreed that if we do that, he will let me add to that no more mandatory minimums, end of federal government use of any private prison, additional funding for drug courts, bail reform, no juveniles, period, in prisons with adults, period. Treatment in jail for those with substance disorders. The criminalization of marijuana, automatic expungement of marijuana use and convictions. Job training in prison so when you get out, you have a chance, a fighting chance, and a real opportunity to succeed when released from incarceration, including being able to take advantage of pub Pell Grants and education grants. It's ridiculous when they've served their time to not give them the opportunity to succeed. Folks, we can do this, and we can do it together. But all of you know that you can't govern unless you can win. And together, we're going to win. You know, I know in moments like this, everybody can be disheartened. It seems like we're on the verge of so much progress just a few years ago. And now, so much of what we gained is under attack. But don't lose hope. Hope springs eternal. I know it seems impossible, but is it impossible? Again, think back to January of 2009. 2009, when Barack Obama came and picked up a kid in Delaware to become president. Folks, the fact of the matter is, you know, I think every once in a while, in a generation of, excuse me, quoting an Irish poet, he said in a poem called Cure at Troy, he says, history teaches us not to hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, that longed-for tidal wave of justice rises up, and hope and history rhyme. Let's make it rhyme. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for looking me over. We can do this. We can do anything we set our mind to. I promise you. God bless you, and may God keep you safe.